Well, it's kind of neat to look out to the congregation and then be out in the congregation and look up at the worship team and realize that a big chunk of the congregation is now up on the worship team. (laughs) Right? That tells us that God is at work and that we're listening and that we're available to serve him. And so thank you, worship team, for leading us into the Lord's presence here this morning. Uh, Let's pray. Father, we, again, um, thank you and uh, are here to worship you. And as we look into your word, uh, may we be found uh, bowing before it, resting in it, trusting in what your word uh, says to us and speaks to us. And Father, may we be found faithful in our response um, to what you have to say. Thank you so much, Father, that you haven't left us in the dark, that you've spoken to us through your word, but most importantly, you have spoken to us in your Son. And through the sending of your Son, we have salvation, we have redemption, uh, we have a future hope, an eternal hope. But through your Son and with your Son and in your Son, we can see you. The great questions that we have concerning God are answered as we look into the face of your precious Son. And so help us here today, I pray, to hear from you, to listen to you, to be reminded once again of the great wonder of the Incarnation, the great wonder of your Son, the great wonder and splendor of what we call Christmas. And so we bow before you here this morning, and we worship you, and we love you, and we pray this as always in Christ's precious, precious name. Amen. Well, it is said in this nation that materialism is at an all-time high, and if you doubt that for a single moment, all you need to do is get in your car and travel to this thing we call the mall. Several years ago, we had a chance to experience the Mall of America at Christmas time. Hundreds of stores filled with thousands of consumers shopping like a feeding frenzy. I walked away from the mall thinking to myself how we have lost the meaning of Christmas. And I wonder if I stopped those thousands of shoppers and asked them this simple question, what is the meaning of Christmas? I wonder what kind of answers I would receive. Some would say it's the spirit of giving. Or maybe some would respond, it's goodwill towards men. Some would say it's a time to extend love and care and compassion to others. Some would say it's a time to mend hurts, reconcile relationships. Some would say it's a time to rest and reflect upon life. Not so sure I would get that response while they were standing in line, but they might just come up with that in the moment. And some would say it's a time to be with family and to be with loved ones. And while all these things might be nice and all of these things might be good, they are far from what Christmas truly means. And certainly they are far from what Scripture declares this season to be all about. This morning I want to spend some time looking at the real meaning of Christmas. And in order to do this, I want us to take the word Christmas apart, to dismantle it, so to speak, and to look at it letter by letter. And I want us to see that in the word Christmas, we can discover its real meaning. I think all of us should agree that at the very beginning, at the very outset, that C stands for Christ. They're at the very core of Christmas, at the very heart of Christmas. It is 
always and must always be about Christ and Christ alone. Christmas is all about Christ. You take Christ out of Christmas and you have nothing left. We can talk about the noble issues of peace, the noble issues of tranquility, of joy and harmony, but without Christ, they are simply ideals that we can never achieve and we can never attain apart from Him. Christmas is not about Christmas trees. It's not about tinsel. It's not about ornaments. It's not about lights. It is not about Santa. It's not about the elves. It's not about the reindeer. It's not about the North Pole. It's not about Frosty the snowman or Rudolph the reindeer, as cute as they are. It's not about shopping. It's not about wrapping. It's not about ribbons. It's not about bows. It's not even about the presents. Christmas is all about Christ. It's amazing to me in this nation how we can celebrate anything else but Christ. So it's okay to celebrate Hanukkah. It's okay to celebrate Kwanzaa. It's okay to celebrate just about anything. But don't talk about Jesus. Remove the nativity scene. Fill it in with anything else that you can find. But we really don't want to talk too much about that little baby in a manger. I wonder what Mary must have thought while she laid in that manger. Town in the midst of celebration due to the consensus. Families gathering together. Catching up on old times. Meeting little Johnny and little Susie for the first time. I really wonder. People just filled with joy. And yet the whole time they missed the miracle. The whole time they missed Christ. The whole time they miss the message. And then I wonder what she would think if she saw all of us today celebrating, laughing, all the while Christ is somewhere in the background, missing in the moment. I wonder what the angels see. I wonder what heaven sees when it looks down, down upon us, a people with such great need, such great desperation, such great hurt, can't be masked by the presence in the bows, in the ribbons. I wonder what they see. I think we need to be like the wise men who searched for Jesus, who traveled the long way, the hard way, the distant way. But they traveled with a sense of purpose, with a sense of meaning, searching for that someone, the Messiah, the King of kings, the King like no other. Coming into the the homeland of the king, going door to door. Where is he who is to be born king of the Jews? And Oh, they had all the right answer. It was Bethlehem. Never slowed down enough for themselves to ponder, to reflect, to start searching as well. So the wise men moved on. We need to be like the shepherds who ran to see the child of God. And we need to be like the disciples who saw Christ transfigured before them as he peeled back his humanity and the Shekinah glory shone brightly before their very eyes, brighter than the sunniest sun, if you could imagine that. We're taught not to stare at the sun. It could blind us. No man can truly look upon the glory of God and live Moses wanted to see what God told him he couldn't see just yet. The glory of the living God. 
Christmas is all about and must always be all about Christ. And Christmas is certainly a time to ponder upon the holy. And we do that around Christmas time, the holy, the, the sacred. But here I think H stands for humility. Christmas is about the God of all creation leaving the glories of heaven to take on humanity. I don't think we can fathom the depths of that kind of humility. To leave that which is perfect. To leave that which is eternal. To leave that which is holy. To leave that which is filled with worship. Knowing that you're the one who created all things, knowing you have all power and all authority to come to this fallen world, to walk amongst this fallen flesh, to take on the limitations of humanity, everything that we don't like about us, everything that we hate about aging and getting older and weakening and all of that stuff that we long to be out of, to long for heaven, to long for everything that he left, to take on the worst of what we experience, and even more, to take on the limitations of humanity and then to take on the scorn of that humanity, to become an infant, to become Helpless. How many like that feeling as human beings? Don't you just hate that moment when you feel helpless? Unable to walk. Unable to feed oneself. To be dependent upon the very humanity you created and sustain each and every day. And then to grow up to serve that humanity. To grow up and then to die for this humanity. All because for the whole of eternity he will always love this humanity. Christmas is all about humility. His in ours. If we want to see the Christ of Christmas, if you want to see the Christ of Christmas, then we too must be a people of humility. There's no room for pride in the kingdom of heaven. No room for arrogance. The scripture tells us the humble have a place in heaven. It's the Humble, who have a special place within the very heart of God. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verses 28 through 29. Come to me, all, all. And by the way, here's your job description for this. Who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I'm gentle and humble in spirit and humble in heart, and you shall find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my load is light. James chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Draw near to God, and he'll draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be miserable and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned into mourning, your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord, and he will exalt you. When I was younger and I was not a believer, 
I didn't know the truth of the gospel, but I did know there was something special about Jesus Christ. I didn't know what it was. I didn't know what it is. I just knew it was there. My grandfather made this special manger scene. He was a woodsmith, a craftsman. He gave it to my parents, and every Christmas I would put that together. I'd take special care, and I'd make sure I had everything exactly where it needed to be, to the best of my ability. I'd lay the straw on there, and I'd set the animals in place, Mary and Joseph. And then the crib. And then the infant Jesus. In the middle of the night, parents would be in bed asleep. This little boy would get up out of bed, go out to the Christmas tree. I would bow down on my knees. I didn't even know the truth. But I'd bow down on my knees. And I would just simply look and gaze and wonder and even pray a little prayer. That's how we have to come to him. We have to search for him. we got to go to him. But when we do, with all of the, the lights and all the other stuff, we just come and we humbly bow. Christmas is about humility. I think when we think of Christmas, R stands for rescue. I thought maybe it could stand for redemption, and and certainly that would fit here. But I like the thought of rescue. That our Lord came on a rescue mission for souls. Mark tells us that Christ came to seek and save that which was lost. That Christ was on a divine mission, and that we're that mission. And so the R within Christ. Christmas stands for rescue. People think of redemption or to redeem. They think they're going to go back to the store with a coupon and get something. No, the R in Christmas is all about rescue. Christ didn't come because it would make a great story, create some great music. He came because humanity was in a state of darkness and of death. And that we needed someone to come and rescue us from the peril that lies ahead. That's what the R stands for. I think many years ago, and I think of the coal miners, if you remember that story, there was a group of coal miners in Pennsylvania who had been trapped down within the coal mines. Desperate and near death. Trapped well below the earth, in the caverns. Death certain. And they felt it. And they knew it. And there they were, down in all of that darkness, down in the cold, down in the earth. And they're hungry. And they're frightened. And they're troubled. And they thought that they would never see their loved ones again. Testimony after testimony. That was the greatest fear. They would never be able to see their loved ones, their spouse, their children. And all you have in those kind of moments is desperation and your thoughts. Overwhelming. Can't even imagine the amount of fear. And then, and then, the rescue came. And they found a way to reach down, and I mean down, into the depths, into the darkness. 
into the depravity, into all that fear and hopelessness. But they reached down and they went down and they pulled each one of them up to safety. Many of the miners quit mining after that. Could hardly blame them. They said they had received a second chance in life. Can you imagine? Do you have minutes left? Seconds left? This is it. But now all of a sudden, pulled up out of the depths, we have a second chance on life. Things can be different. Things ought to be different. And that there was no way, they would say, that they would go down, ever go down, into that darkness again. Christmas is about rescue. Pulling souls up out of the earth. Up out of the darkness. Where death is very real. If someone wouldn't reach down to pull us up. To see the light of day once again. A new beginning. A new hope. A new sense of future. Understanding that we will never, ever, ever go back down into that darkness. To that dark place again. That's what Christmas is all about. Reaching down in the depths of darkness to pull us up to safety so that we don't ever have to go down into that dark hole of death again. Well, when we look at the word Christmas, I think it's hard to think of it any other way than this, that the I stands for incarnation. In order to rescue humanity, someone had to go down. Someone had to go down into that dark hole to bring somebody up. Christmas is all about the miracle of the incarnation. That God chose to become a man so that he might be able to rescue the souls of men. No other option, no other alternative, no other way that it could be done. You didn't see a lot of volunteers lining up to take on that cross. You didn't see a long line of human beings lining up, thinking they could get the job done. Nobody perfect. Nobody spotless. Nobody able. We talk about the wonder of Christmas. And I think we see that kind of wonder in the eyes of our children. But if we truly understood, I mean, if we truly slow down and ponder such an amazing event, if we truly grabbed hold of the reality of the incarnation, it should stun us. It should leave us speechless. It should Leave us in a place of awe and wonder. It should absolutely bring us to a place of astonishment, of amazement, of incredible, incredible awe that God, the God, would become a man, fully man, Fully God. John chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God. All things came into being by Him, and apart from Him, nothing came into being that has come into being. The whole of creation. In him was life. And the life 
was the light of men. And that light shines in darkness. And the darkness did not comprehend it. And the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory. Glory as of the only begotten from the Father, full of grace, full of truth. And then in verse 18, John goes on to say that it is the Word, it is the Son of God who became flesh. He has explained Him. He has disclosed the wonder of the living God. 1 John chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. What was from the beginning, what we have heard, what we have seen with our eyes. I mean, we've seen what we beheld with our hands. Our hands actually touched concerning the word of life. And the life was manifested. We have seen and bear witness and proclaim to you the eternal life, which was with the Father and was manifested to us. What we've seen and what we've heard, we proclaim to you also, that you also may have fellowship with us, and indeed our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. The wonder of the incarnation is that it brings us face to face with the living God. So if you're here this morning, and you wonder what God is like. Or we're here and so often we want to see him. Father, I just want to know what you're like. I just want to know who you are. We find those answers. We see that truth in the person of Jesus Christ. We have a very real photo op with the living God. We have a photograph. We have the divine image. You want to know the heart of God? Oh, my land, we need to find and see and know the heart of his son. The real meaning of Christmas is that God came so that we could see him. That was the longing of Israel, to see the Messiah, the Messiah to come. It's the longing of our souls. The Lord come quickly. That one day he'll come. Take care of kingdom business. In a very, very real way. We long to be with him. We long to see him. But scripture tells us we can see him. And that there are those who have. So close was John that he could hear the heart of God. He did so that we could know him, so that we could love him, and so that we could be loved by him. Well, the problem with all of this thus far is this. Something always stands in the way. There's always something getting in the way of this relationship. As difficult as this may be to grasp, S stands for sin. Not something you want to put in your Christmas stocking, now is it? The S stands for sin. Please note at the very center of Christmas is this whole issue of sin. Four letters before it. Four letters behind it. Right in the heart of it all, we have this S. Oh, we want to leap to salvation, don't we? Can't leap there because we keep tripping over the S. It stands for sin. There's a reason why we need to be rescued. And there's a reason why the incarnation. And the reason is this. Man, apart from God, is in real, real trouble. And man, apart from God, is in serious, serious danger. This Sunday, this nation and this world 
is going to be running around, filling up with food and fun and all kinds of things, and never thinking for a moment about this issue here called sin. Very easy to do, by the way. I don't think our children are thinking a single thing about it when they get up in the morning and are racing to the tree. Ah, I'm such a sinner. Why? Because they all think they're good and they're on Santa's goody-goody list. And the only bad thing about Christmas is you didn't get me the gift I wanted. Because I'm special. Yeah, there's some truth to that. Our children are special. But apart from Christ, we're all children of wrath. And I think sometimes we forget that. We forget that in the midst of all of this wonder, there is some real wreckage. And we forget that there's a real reason why Christ had to come. A real reason why Christ had to die. And we forget that God had to become a man. Because man had rejected God. There's some real reasoning behind all of this. We forget that Christmas is not about filling our plates or stuffing our stockings. Christmas, at the core of it all, is about a humanity that has violated the heart of God. And there's only one way to fix that problem. And that only way was for Christ to come. The only way was for God himself to come. We hear this passage all the time, so often that I think we begin to even ignore it. But John 3, 16 through verse 18, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son. Here is the reason for Christmas, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to judge the world, but that the world should be saved through him. He who believes in him is not judged. He who does not believe has been judged already because he's not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Yeah, Christmas is all about presence. The presence of God in his Son, Jesus Christ. And either you open the present and take it on in or you leave it under the tree, in which case we are in real trouble. For God so loved us that he did something about it. Christmas is God's solution to mankind's sin problem. We leap to Easter on this one. But at the center of Christmas is this whole issue of our deep, deep need. Well, in the midst of all the tinsel and all of the trappings, T stands for truth. If there's one thing I know for certain, this season has been filled with all kinds of deception. Children grow up knowing Santa but have no clue who Christ is or what Christ has done. Children anticipate opening up their presents but never opening their hearts to God. Parents, fall prey to the pressure of the season. To buy more, to spend more, to have better lights, to have a bigger tree, to have better presents. The media fills our minds with lies about how much we're going to save on this and how much we're going to save on that. Or how much this present will satisfy our children's every desire. They'll be happy forever. And then when the season is over, we step back and we realize how duped we've really been. What the world needs is truth. And so scripture tells us, and the word, the truth, the lagos became flesh and dwelt among us, full of grace and full of truth. Hebrews, and I preached on this a few weeks ago, chapter 1, verses 1 through 4. 
God, after he spoke long ago to the fathers and the prophets in many portions, in many ways, always communicating, always reaching out. In these last days, he's spoken to us in his Son, whom he appointed the heir of all things, through whom also he made the world. And he is the exact radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature and upholds all things by the word of his power. When he had made purification for sins, there's that S, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Christmas, Christmas is all about God's truth. John chapter 14, verse 6. I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, and this is emphatic, by the way. In the Greek it would read like this. No one, and that means you, comes to the Father but through me and through me alone. If you had known me, you would have known my Father. From now on, you know him and have seen him. We often use the expression Merry Christmas. But I think the M here stands for mercy. I thought maybe M could stand for miraculous. Wouldn't you think that? If I said, what do you think about the letter M? It'd be easy to say, you know what? Miraculous. I think of John the Baptist's birth miraculous think of the birth of christ it's miraculous think of new birth as a believer it's miraculous i thought maybe m could stand for majestic i mean certainly christ's birth is filled with all kinds of majestic moments you think of the angelic majesty you think of the angels you think of the heavenly chorus i mean it's majestic You think of the wise men falling on their knees before Christ and worshiping Him. And you think of all of us as we bow before Him and we worship. There is a certain element of majesty. And there should be. But I think M should stand for mercy. Because Christmas is all about God's mercy and God's grace. God could have left us in our condition. I mean, he could have left us in our condition. And he would be absolutely just in doing so. But God's love and mercy compels him to act. And it compels him to act in love and mercy. And so in the incarnation, the birth of Christ, it is a display of God's incredible mercy on our behalf. Look at Ephesians 2.4. But God, being rich in mercy, because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in our transgressions, made us alive together with Christ. By grace, you have been saved. Christmas is all about God's mercy. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 to 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, according to his great mercy, has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, that's reserved for all of us in heaven for the likes of us but in accordance to his great mercy caused us to be born again. Well, as we ponder Christmas, I would suggest that A stands for adoption. And once again, I thought maybe A could stand for atonement. And we know that's why Christ came to atone for our sins, to die in place of us. And certainly, I don't think we can avoid addressing our need for a Savior or God's sacrifice for us. But that is so much of our focus during 
Easter and our need for a sacrificial lamb. And so atonement is here, but we think of that in terms of the Passover and so forth. We could think of A in terms of adoration. That is certainly there as well. But I think that A stands for adoption. Because I think Christmas is all about taking children of wrath and making them children of God. Someone quoted, Christ became like us so that we might become like Him. Another said, Christ came to earth so that we might one day be with Him in heaven. John chapter 1, verse 12. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Even to those who believe in his name, who were born not of blood, not of humanity, nor the will of the flesh, nor the will of man, but must be born of the will of God. He gave them the right to become children of God. I don't think we think about this too much at Christmas time, but Christmas really is about adoption. Now look at Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 through 7. But when the fullness of time came, they have to bring this into its context. We read the Hebrews passage of God speaking through the prophets, many portions, many ways. And so that long journey of the incarnation and the Messiah to come. And in that appointed time, in that perfect timing, Scripture would say, not a day sooner, not a day later, but in the perfect moment, when everything was lined up as it ought to be, God enters into humanity. So when the fullness of that time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, in order that he might redeem those who were under that law, that we might receive, here you go, the adoption as sons. In the fullness of time, God sent forth his son to adopt us into his family so that we might become children of of the living God. When we think of Christmas, we think of the children. We think of all of those things. But God is thinking of children in the sense of us becoming his children. And because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Most of us know of people who grew up in difficult family situations where the father or a stepfather mistreated them, ignored them, maybe violated them. And then came the day of salvation. In the midst of all of that ugliness, in the midst of all of that, a child cries out and asks, the God who created them to become the Father to them. The Father who's like no other. Or maybe we know of children adopted from around the world, from orphanages, from China, Romania, the list goes on and on. Those small infants, never touched by human hands, by the way. Barely ever cradled. Barely even fed. Knowing, think about it, to grow up in that culture, that society, oftentimes godless. Ethics and morals out the window. Life is dispendable and discarded. What future, what hope, what life would they have? People, the, the likes of us, who know the Lord, reach out and reach in and reach deep. And they rescue a child from that environment to bring him into their home, to love on them, to bring truth into their lives, to model forgiveness, to model compassion, to model care. Their future, completely different now. Because somebody reached in 
to make a difference in their life. He's the father of the lonely. He's the father of the hurting. He's the father of the widow. He's the father of the orphan. He's the father of the neglected. He's the father for the despised and the rejected. Christmas is all about becoming children of the living God. And being introduced to the Heavenly Father who created you. Well, finally, to wrap up, Christmas with a golden bow, S stands for Savior. Luke chapter 2, verse 11. For today in the city of David, there has been born for you a Savior who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Christmas is all about Christ, and therefore Christmas is all about a Savior. And therefore, Christmas is always about salvation. We can never forget the reason God sent His Son and His only Son. It wasn't so we could gather around a Christmas tree and unwrap presents. It wasn't so we could gather around the table and see how much we can stuff ourselves full. It wasn't so we could run around like crazy with last-minute shopping. It wasn't so we could see how well we could decorate our homes with lights and displays. God sent His Son because we need Him. God sent His Son because He loves us. And God sent his son, because without his son, we have no hope of heaven. Without God's son, we have no life. And without God's son, we absolutely have no Christmas. Listen to what Titus chapter 2, verse 11 through 15 says. For the grace of God has appeared bringing salvation to all men, instructing us to deny ungodliness and worldly desires and to live sensibly, righteously, and godly in this present age, looking for the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of our great God and Savior, Christ Jesus, who gave himself for us that he might redeem, that he might rescue us from every lawless deed, and purify for himself a people for his own possession, zealous for good deeds, zealous for the things of God. These things speak and exhort and reprove with all authority. Let no one disregard you. And so I bring to you this morning the real meaning of Christmas. Majesty in the midst of the mundane. Holiness in the filth of sheep manure and sweat. Divinity entering the world on the floor of a stable, through the womb of a teenager, and in the presence of a carpenter. A God with tears. A creator with a heart. God became earth's mockery to save his children. How absurd to think that such nobility would go to such poverty to share such a treasure with such thankless souls. But he did. In fact, the only thing more absurd than the gift is our stubbornness and our unwillingness to receive it. Let's pray. Father, we worship you and we bow before you. And we adore you through your Son, whom we forever adore. Guide us, I pray, this week, this day, 
bring us to the place when we gather once again and we are ready, oh so ready, to worship you. Help us, I pray, never to lose, never to lose the meaning of Christmas. To reflect deeply, to ponder deeply. I pray this morning if there's anyone here, a soul here that doesn't know you, that even now in this moment, it's their opportunity to reach up, knowing that you're reaching down that they might give their heart to you, that they might pray in this moment, Lord Jesus, I have not known you, but I want to know you now. You've created me, you made me, but you made me to know you, and I'm incomplete until I do. I bring all the baggage, all the scars, all the defeats and disappointments, all of my messed upness I bring to you. And I ask that you'd wash me clean. I ask that you'd forgive me. I ask that you'd come into my life and live in me and through me by your Spirit. That in that moment, I'm born anew, born again. But I've become your child. And so I ask, Lord Jesus, for you to come in and rescue me that I might follow you the rest of my life, that I might know you and love you and know your incredible eternal love for me. I pray that they pray that prayer. Lord Jesus, I pray you'd fill this place up Christmas Eve with those who long to worship you, but those who are searching to find you. And may we all be found in that place of worship and of humility and of your great grace, we pray in Christ's name. Amen.